Thanks, Kay. This image, the dress, went viral in February of this year, and obviously most of you have seen it, because it was the subject of literally millions of tweets, blogs, thought pieces, and a buzz poll with over three million respondents. And people were asked, do you see white and gold or blue and black? Out of curiosity, how many people see white and gold? How many people see blue and black? OK, well, that's similar-ish proportions to the buzz poll. About two-thirds of respondents saw white and gold and about one-third saw blue and black, which it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's essentially a pretty bad photo of an ordinary dress that someone's mother wore to her wedding and they weren't famous or looking for publicity. So the real question is, why did it go viral? And it's because we believe what we see. We think that what we see is physical reality. So we just can't get our heads around the idea that someone next to us can see the same image on the same screen and see different colours. But as a scientist who works on animal colour and vision, the fact that two people see different colours doesn't really surprise me. And being a scientist, I actually don't believe anything I see anyway. I have to measure it. What the dress phenomenon really illustrates to me is that what we see is not physical reality. It's our interpretation of that reality. And if we see the, 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 the colours of nature through the eyes of animals, it reveals a whole other reality. And not only that, it can lead to some really exciting technological innovations. Now, I've spent the last 15 years or so working on lizards, because we all have our eccentricities. And in particular, lizards that change colour. The masters of colour change amongst lizards are, of course, chameleons. So after I finished my postgrad studies, I set off for South Africa for the next four years to work on chameleons. And I spent much of that time living out of this tiny dome tent with my now husband. And we would move from forest remnant to forest remnant, searching for every species of dwarf chameleon in the country. To give you some context, this is a fully grown adult male. So after catching a bunch of these, which is a whole other story, we would measure how they change colour in response to other chameleons and to predators a stuffed bird and a fake snake. And we would watch these things change colour in front of our eyes, from perfect camouflage to these gorgeous blues and greens and pinks and yellows. These two males have been displaying to each other, and the one on the left is the winner, and the one on the right, you can make him out in dark brown, is the loser. But if you pitch these males against different opponents, the one on the left could just as easily be the dark brown loser. The degree of colour change is really dramatic. And every species has different display colours. This is a male of a different species displaying to a female in the background. And so four years of studying chameleon colour change really showed me how exquisitely evolution could tailor the colour of animals for different purposes, like communication or camouflage. And it also taught me about animal vision how chameleons and their predators might see the world. But apart from telling us more about really awesome creatures like chameleons, what is it that nature's colours can tell us more generally? Well, for starters, I think they can tell us about some interesting principles of design. High contrast colours like orange and black can obviously make an animal more conspicuous, but it can also do the exact opposite. It can create camouflage. And that's because high contrast colours can break up or disrupt the outline of an animal, especially when one of those colours blends into the background. They can create illusions of false edges and boundaries. This is a poison dart frog. And so that high contrast yellow and black might be a conspicuous warning of its toxicity. 
But if you see this frog in context, it's actually quite hard to make out its outline in the first place because the black blends into the darkness of the background. So is it conspicuous? Is it camouflaged? Or is it both, depending on who's looking at it and under what circumstances? We use this principle of disruptive coloration in military camouflage. Military uniforms and vehicles like this helicopter often have high contrast blotches of black and green and cream. And some of those colours blend into the colours of the environment like vegetation and sand, which makes it hard to recognise the outline of the helicopter. And in fact, the military has been drawing on the knowledge of animal camouflage experts for decades. But high contrast colours don't just create illusions of false edges and boundaries, camouflage. They can also create other interesting visual illusions. This is a classic. It shows a square labelled A up the top and it looks darker than the one labelled B in the middle. But they're actually exactly the same colour. If you don't believe me, here they are in isolation with the rest of the image wiped out. Now we see this illusion because our brains compensate for the contrast of the surrounding squares. And not only that, our brains compensate for the illumination, the shadow cast by the green, uh, the green cylinder. And that's in fact the answer to the dress phenomenon. Those of us like me who see white and gold are actually overcompensating for a very yellowish backlit illumination in the photo. And the illumination, the light in natural scenes, of course, varies wildly from orangish light of sunsets, green light in forests, the light that filters through murky water. And so those of us who study animal colour don't just look at colours in isolation. We look at colours relative to each other, relative to the background and relative to the illumination. Interior designers and artists do the same. But if we want to understand how animals see those colours, we also have to understand about animal vision. And that can be very different to our own. My favourite example is uh, cuttlefish and octopuses and their relatives. They are the masters of colour change in the ocean, and yet they don't even see colour. They see in shades of grey. We know that birds, many reptiles, many fish, many insects can see ultraviolet colours, which we, of course, don't. To give you an idea of what that looks like, these are three images of the same flower. On the left, we have the flower as we see it, a uniform blue. Just checking, <laughs> it is yellow. <laughs> In the middle, we have the flower photographed under, under ultraviolet light. And on the right, we have the flower as a bee might see it. Not just different colours, but a whole different pattern. I think the dress has nothing on this. And images like this can only give us the tiniest glimpse of what the world looks like to animals. And that's because we only have three kinds of photoreceptors that we use for colour vision. A mantis shrimp has 12. And polarisation vision as well. So not only can a mantis shrimp see whole wavelength bands like the ultraviolet that we can't, it can distinguish colours that we can't. Two blues that look the same to us would look different to a mantis shrimp. The world to a mantis shrimp is probably a much more colourful place than it is to us. And we can't even begin to imagine what that looks like. So seeing the world and nature's colours through animal eyes, I think, really does reveal a whole other reality. But how does that generate technological innovation? Well, it turns out that mantis shrimp vision is being used by a group at Queensland University to fine-tune remote sensing technology to be able to better monitor the health of coral reefs from space. How bees process colour is being used to guide developments in machine vision and learning. Material scientists have mimicked the nanostructures that produce 
iridescent coloration in butterfly wings and bird feathers. There are lots of examples. But my research group has been looking at colour from a slightly different perspective. We've been interested in how colour affects temperature. Now, we all know from experience that when we're out in the sun, we feel warmer wearing dark colours than we do wearing light colours. And that's because dark colours absorb light, which is energy, and that's converted into heat. The theme of this TEDx event is when dark meets light. Well, this is dark and light literally, if you like, the physical properties of a dark and light surface. On the x-axis down the bottom, we have the wavelengths of visible light, and on the y-axis, we have how much of that light is reflected. So a white surface reflects all wavelengths of visible light, whereas a dark surface absorbs all wavelengths. Now, we've been working on bearded dragon lizards, and these lizards change colour from light to dark in response to temperature. These two individuals are exactly the same lizard. It's um, the same in individual in an incubator set at 15 degrees and at 40 degrees. So a cold, dark lizard, when it's out in the sun instead of in an incubator, would absorb more sunlight, more solar energy, which would allow it to heat up faster and become active. A, a hot, light lizard would reflect more of that energy, which could prevent it from overheating. Now, that in itself didn't surprise us. But what did surprise us was that they only change colour on their backs in response to temperature. And yet when they're displaying to each other, their beard or throat and chest becomes jet black. Again, the same lizard with the one on the left showing his display colours, black beard and chest, and the one on the right showing his normal drab colours. Now, material scientists have actually created materials that change colour in much the same way that these lizards do. This thread is being developed by material scientists at the CSIRO, and it changes colour in response to heat. Ultimately, it can be used to make things like colour-changing bandages, because when a wound is infected, it generates heat, and so the bandage would change colour. But lizards can teach us more. We actually only see a small part of the spectrum of sunlight. This is the full spectrum of sunlight reaching the Earth's surface. So now that whole graph of black and white is condensed into the rainbow band. And on the left, we have the uh, uh, ultraviolet. And on the right, we have this whole big chunk called the near-infrared. Now, we can't see that near-infrared. And in fact, no animal can. Some of you who watch lots of wildlife documentaries might be thinking, what about snakes? Don't some snakes sense infrared? And it's true that some snakes have infrared or heat sensing pits, but heat is much longer wavelength infrared. That's what thermal imaging cameras or infrared cameras are measuring. They're measuring heat. It's not the near infrared. So if no animal senses it, why does it matter? And it's because more than half of the energy in direct sunlight falls within the near-infrared. And that has important consequences. If we absorb that energy, we heat up. Now, when we were working on these bearded dragon lizards, we discovered that lizards that look the same, have the same colour, actually have completely different properties in the near-infrared. To show you what I mean, this is a research assistant in my lab, Ashton, and she's wearing a black cotton T-shirt and black cotton pants. Now, they're both black, so they both absorb light in the visible spectrum, but they're completely different in the near-infrared. The black T-shirt is absorbing, or sorry, reflecting most of that near-infrared, and so it's what I call a cool black. The jeans are absorbing most of that near-infrared, so they're literally hot pants. And it's the same for any colour, 
You can get two reds that look the same differ in the near infrared or vice versa, two colours that are the same in the near infrared but look different. And that's why I don't believe what I see. That's why I have to measure it. And it turns out that bearded dragon lizards can not only change their visible colour, they can change how their skin reflects near infrared. So these lizards can get the best of all possible worlds. Not only can they hone their visible colour for communication or camouflage, but they can change how their skin reflects both visible and near-infrared light to be able to regulate their body temperature. So I think we can learn from lizards. I think we can get a lot smarter about the materials that we design. They can be materials for anything, for paints, for roofing, for, uh, for cars, even fabrics. Why don't we create materials that have the colours that we want but also have the properties that we want in the near infrared. We can make cool reds and yellows and blues for the tropics and hot reds and yellows and blues for high latitudes. We know that materials differ in their near infrared properties and I think we can harness that to save energy passively in the same way that a lizard does. And what if we could create materials that change in the near infrared? I think this is a wide open frontier for human innovation. And so I think that looking at nature's colours, understanding nature's colours and how animals see them really has and will continue to inspire creativity and innovation. And it's research like this, basic research driven by curiosity about the world that we live in that often leads to unexpected discoveries and that can have important technological spin-offs. That's in fact the case for almost every major technological innovation in the history of science. It's born from basic curiosity-driven research. And so as an evolutionary biologist, my passion, what really sparks my curiosity is how and why something as stunning as this has evolved. Thank you. <laughs>